in all of our work, as New Red Order, we never appear. And that's a, sort of a, a political statement on our part. As indigenous people, we've often been called upon to act as informants. We ask ourselves, how can we resist that kind of performance of indigeneity, which often contributes to the flattening of indigenous peoples? I also think there's a part of it too, where we're also resisting the narrative of like the singular artist. Doing things like sitting down for an interview and showing our faces feels not right. This is where our program will play, where you can kind of get up to speed with what the NRO can offer and uh, highly encourage everyone to join, sign up. This free introductory video, The New Red Order, Never Settle, will tell you what you need to know to take control of your life today. Well, as the program continued, I started to sleep better. I had higher levels of energy. My work improved. New Red Order really sort of emerged out of thinking through how, especially in the Americas, but also internationally, there's a real intense desire for indigeneity. And oftentimes that desire is something that has really negative effects on indigenous people. It can be something that's appropriative or romanticized, and often a desire that's extractive, that you know, non-indigenous people take from indigenous people uh, without giving anything back. In some ways, that desire for indigeneity is becoming more and more prevalent in sort of our current times of existential and environmental catastrophe. Former colonial powers are looking towards indigenous people for ways of surviving our impending apocalypse, especially since indigenous peoples have already lived through an apocalypse. To think about the sort of colonization of the Americas is a process that you know took over 500 years. And so we're really interested in thinking about ways of undoing that process, or more so than undoing, of pushing forward an indigenous future. And that's what, what we're really focused on more than anything else. You know, in European airports, you go to the gift shop, we'll have some ice cream uh, from Corolla Gran, a Tsunami artist. This up here is Uvagut TV, 24-7 live streaming Inuit TV channel. First of its kind. Usually there's like CNN or something, but this is like our dream of some kind of indigenous airport. We confront the question of what would it take to uh, address years of colonization. For others who are non-Indigenous, what would it take for them to commit to action and solidarity with Indigenous people? Would it take crimes against reality? Would it take becoming an accomplice as opposed to an ally? We think a lot about words like decolonization and repatriation. Their meaning, I think, is often quite diffuse in ways that uh, can be really powerful or in ways that can be um, the opposite can make it mean almost absolutely nothing. Decolonization to us means the repatriation of all indigenous land and life, not simply just a way of changing how cultural institutions or universities are structured. In that sense, a truly decolonial act is inherently against the law, which is why we're calling for accomplices and not allies because in order to truly serve as an accomplice to indigenous people, you have to risk going against colonial powers. When we got started doing this research, it was really frustrating because there is this kind of pervasive silence around addressing these concerns here, but also like seeing and feeling that there is like a lot of momentum and things bubbling under the surface. There's works in the show that complicate this kind of solidarity. This is Christabel Stewart's Truth to Material installation. Christabel's an amazing artist who's been working with uh, in Germany, they have this history of Indianers. It stems back from like the late 1800s. <laughs> so it's very prevalent in the German imaginary, this idea of being Indian or playing Indian. Including groups like Sobongen, who have participated in what may seem at this moment like an inappropriate acts of dressing up as Native, it was really important for us to include those moments because often people's experience with indigeneity or indigenous people comes from a flat representation first, and then they have to work through that and negotiate through that in order to start to understand. It's incredibly frustrating, but it, it seems to be a reality that that sort of idea of that stereotype, um, you know, it's a symbol that uh, to a lot of people actually stands in place for over 500 distinct cultural groups. I've encountered many people who don't think that Native Americans exist anymore because of this sort of stereotyped image. You know, depending on where you are, you might not actually have any interactions with Native people. So it does seem to be necessary to point towards 
the one thing that people are actually aware of as a means of moving beyond it and into a more nuanced engagement. This is our kind of contribution, thinking through uh, monuments, where they come from, what they mean, and what to do with them now. And we kind of made this kind of 3D CGI animation film that'll kind of unpack this idea of uh, additive defacement as opposed to subtractive or removal. Yeah, I feel like humor is really important to our practice and also our mode of address to the public because what we're hoping to bring people to the table to think through is really difficult and can be really painful. Humor can be a form of acknowledgement, kind of calling in others to feel that kind of ludicrous situation with us, even if our experience is different than theirs. Native humor is a real strength and a real tool that we've used to endure and sort of survive throughout our colonization. It just seems like a, a generative space to sort of crack open the conversation. Cool. Thank you so much. Thanks. We like talking, we're just scared of the cameras. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs>